GDR on-campus providers, University of Sussex, City University, BPP at all its locations. BPP has like, I think between six and eight different locations, Leeds, Bristol. So you have BPP, ULaw also has a bunch of different locations and they actually offer it at all their locations, both of them. Um, where else? We have Swansea University, Plymouth, um, Nottingham, Trent, and a bunch of other universities. So we have 24 um, GDL providers in total. So you get a nice range to choose from. There are schools in Man Manchester that also offer the GDL. So you have a good range of choice for on-campus um, GDL providers. But again, learning might all be online now. So it really probably won't matter what will be. Location is not going to be the factor. It might actually be fees and something else that makes your decision for you. Um, we also have in Wales, um, Cardiff University. Cardiff offers um, the GDL. I feel like if I hadn't gone to City, I probably would have gone to Cardiff, which would have been really interesting. Um, but again, you're called to the Bar of England and Wales, so they have that just one, but they do have a GDL provider. Other costs you need to be aware of are firstly, a certificate of academic standing, COAS, an in admission, in admission, I realize I said that as one word, in admission cost, and your BCAT costs. Those are the three that will come out um, as you progress to the BPTC. So the certificate of academic standing is basically a certificate that the Bar Standards Board, which is the regulator of all barristers in England and Wales, um, requires you to show that your undergraduate degree essentially is the equivalent of a, an honours degree in the UK. Now that requirement is steep, but it's not unattainable, it's fine. They teach differently in the UK than they do in other places, I find, at least with Canada and um, the UK. Courses were conducted differently, weighted differently and all of that. So as an international student, what I had to do was convert um, my marks, my overall GPA to the classification in the UK. And there's a whole process to do that. There's some great calculators, which I will link below for you. But you basically need to be talking to um, the person in charge of admissions at the universities that you're applying to to figure out how to convert that. So you would have done that um, in your application procedure before you even attain um, an acceptance. And you will need to do that with, for, with the COAS as well. Um, it is a bit of a tedious process. You need to fill in a whole application form. Um, I think it's been updated now in that you fill the form and you're only allowed certain pieces you're only required to submit certain pieces of information from your former institution. But for me at the time, this was in 2017, I literally had to compile my entire syllabi from four years of undergraduate degree, the um, grade criteria for each and every course. I think I'd taken maybe 35 courses by the end or something like that. So all of that syllabi, all of their grading um, criteria, um, I, I needed them to be signed by my professors and what else and then I needed everything to be posted from my like compiled for me and posted from my university along with a letter from um, the associate director of my um, of the Department of Arts at my university saying yes I completed this um, I also did it fully in English um, I attained this degree and sign off on it, stamp it, and have that sent to the BSB, which is the Bar Standards Board. So now there's an online application that makes it a bit smoother, but just in case, start to compile all of this information, as much thorough information as you can about your undergraduate degree. If, again, your undergraduate degree was taken outside of the UK, if it's not, you don't need to deal with that, but you will need to fill this form, submit it, 
the form has to be accepted. It has to be accepted that your degree is actually equivalent to this for you to even go to the BPTC. Um, I didn't know that I needed this until I was applying. I already applied for the BPTC and I was applying for my in admission. So what happened was the in called me and said, oh, you applied and submitted this a month ago, but you only have two weeks until your um, application runs out and I was just, I just asked what, I don't understand what you mean. I've done this on time. Everything was done in a timely fashion. What is, why has my application been stalled? And they told me that they require COAS of every international student, which is something my university didn't bring to my attention. And that's why it's so critical for me to bring this to your attention now, because it's something that they require, they need to see before accepting you into the end that it's it's I feel like it's a bit of an artificial requirement, but here we are because your previous degree has no way on whether you take the GDL or not. You're still allowed to take the GDL. And at that point in time, I had completed the GDL, done the BCAT, done everything. So this was the one thing standing in my way of being able to start the BPTC. And it was a bit of a shock. So I had two weeks to compile all of that information make sure I make the deadline so that I don't have to postpone my BPTC year to the next year. And it was a bit hectic. It's something you can obtain while you are doing the GDL. There's no restriction to that. So I would advise that you obtain that while you're doing the GDL or when you're coming to the finishing of it. You apply for the BPTC at the beginning of the year in January. So once you apply for that, you can also do it then if you didn't do it earlier. But please don't wait till the summer before the BPTC to do it if it's not brought to your attention. So you want to deal with this ahead of time and also take this cost into account is 200 pounds. It is still 200 pounds thankfully two years later. Um, but again, 200 pounds is not chicken change. So note that. The next cost is the BCAT, which is an aptitude test also required by the Bar Standards Board. <laughs> um, it is 150 pounds. It's pretty. It's a pretty easy test. Um, don't don't take my word for it. But in terms of having done the the uh, what did I do? ACT and all of those other things, I can say it's it's a, it's a much easier. Um, I think I even did the LSATs. Um, it's a much easier aptitude test um, than a lot of the North American ones. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily. It doesn't actually test legal knowledge. It's a bunch of very interesting questions that require legal analysis in terms of like. Not even, let me actually correct myself. They don't require legal analysis, but it requires critical analysis of whatever the question is. So you want to apply some legal reasoning in that you are applying logical reasoning, but it's not, you're not going to be tested on like contract law concepts. You're not going to be tested on anything that you actually learned at the GDL. So I took it at the end. Once I was done with the GDL, I took it in the summer and then sent the results straight away to the end. Um, so you need, once you've passed the BCAT, certif um, BCAT exam, you get a certificate, which you then submit with your um, BPTC application to your school and to the N. And then you also, when you pass the COAS application, if your application is accepted, it's not a test, so I'm not really sure how to describe it. But basically, once they are proved that, you know, you have an equivalent degree or you have a degree that is similar to an honours degree um, in the UK, um, you get a certificate for that as well and you submit that to the end. Um, the, I do want to tell you that you don't need to be too worried about the fact that your degree needs to be equivalent to that of a UK honours degree because at least with Canadians, how the honours system works is different. You go into a, your bachelor's degree you finish your first, maybe second year, and then you apply for an honor. So it's two levels that you actually have to get through, two levels of application that you have to get through to actually get an honors degree, and it's a choice. When you get admitted into UK schools, sometimes you get admitted into an LLB honor degree right away, um, and that's what you're working towards the entire time. So it is a little different, but it's nothing you need to be worried about. You just need to show. In terms of learning and education, I think... Generally, the bachelor's degree in Canada, I found, is just as intense as um, an honors degree here. So, in this sense, it's more the title as opposed to the content. So, don't let that scare you. Because when I saw that, I was just kind of like, oh, 
I'm not I'm not really sure how to prove that and how that's going to be measured but it's a requirement that cannot be circumvented so be aware of that so that's 200 150 and then you're in admission in admission <laughs> sounds like one word um, is a hundred pounds so you will that's that's the cost for basically being admitted to the inn and there's not much to say about that you also have to fill in up an application form um, all the inns admit at the same time have the same deadline for um, the application so let's say it's on a day in uh, let's say October 25th all of the inns will will have that application being submitted by students on the same day so you cannot excuse me you cannot apply to two diff two ends to kind of wedge your bet that's not an option you pick an in and you commit to them if you haven't picked an in at the gdl when you're at the bvtc whether gdl or bvtc you're going to be picking one in so you want to have done your research on the ins during your gdl year to see where your heart is you want to have gone to the events chambers evenings to just see why you want to actually join a particular in i am part of the honorable society of inner temple um my major reason for choosing inner temple is that i found that they were in terms of diversity that their efforts towards diversifying um, the bar and the people they call was was m more um, visible than the other ends for me. So I chose Inner Temple for diversity reasons because I think that's really important and it's really as simple as that. <laughs> So you do want to um, kind of go through and see what's important for you, what what values you hold, what kind of network and access you want, what you feel about not just the history of the inn, but its current um, outlooks, its current goals, um, its current and a community of people. And that's how I came to that decision. So that's a hundred pounds. So that's what about four fifty pounds just outside of. All of the other costs that you need to bear um, there will probably be other costs that come up but nothing that may those costs may be more personal things and personal choices than um, academic okay so let's move away from costs and come back to the content of the GDL itself. So you would be doing seven modules, seven standard modules, no matter what university you are or provider you're at. Um, these are the core modules that everyone needs to do. So we have contract law, criminal law, tort law, equity and trust, um, land law, public law, and who am I forgetting? One eternity later. EU law. <laughs> you will be doing EU law. Um, interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting time to definitely be studying with everything that's going on. It's still an interesting time now. So those are the seven modules that you will absolutely have to do. There might be an English um, legal system test here and there. There might be coursework or some other additions that your, your, your provider might make and that they think is necessary. Um, I think the only other module we did was very brief, took a couple of weeks and it was an introduction to um, ethics. That was it. So those are the modules we'll be covering. Um, it is a lot of reading material for a short period of time. You have to go to tutorials. You have to go prepare to your tutorials. So you will have anything between you could have up to like 300 pages of reading to do for one tutorial for just, let's say just land law, you would have 300 pages. And if you have two or three tutorials or classes that day, I'll let you do the math. So it's a lot of reading. Not all the reading is is um, going to be that much for each day, but that's generally like minimum. You're reading minimum. Minimum 200 pages for any one tutorial, minimum as a total. Um, sometimes there's a lot more than that, but I don't want to scare you. But this is because you're reading cases, you're reading judgments, and you're reading your textbook, you're reading... Um, you get presentations usually after the lectures and tutorials, but the reading material is 
plentiful. No, don't expect anything less. How the course is structured is that you get to do coursework over the nine months. Okay, so now I know I've been saying the GDL is a year, but in essence, it's really is just nine months of learning and then you do the exam and then you're done because you start from September, at least with City, you start in September, you finish courses by the end of March and then you have April and May to study for um, your exams and to do your final piece of coursework. Exams are in June. So again, it's, yeah, basically nine months, not even a full year. So it's quite intense, but everything ends at the end of a full year. So how it's structured is that you then you start classes in September, typically finish in March to give you April and May to study, go through all the material, plan how you're going to answer the questions. Um, and then over the course of those months before classes finish, you have to submit a piece of coursework for each module. And what the coursework does is essentially just helps to see if you're actually understanding the topics that you're learning, if you're understanding certain areas of law, which ones you're struggling with, which ones you don't get. It helps you to kind of see if you're learning because there's no other assessments. They're not little. You don't get homework. You don't get little assessments here and there. You don't have to. You literally just write one piece of coursework per module, which is, I don't think it was more than 2,500 words. And that's it. That's all of the assessment you get that gets marked to kind of tell you where you fall in terms of the grading scale which i will speak about when i talk to you in the another video about how to ace the exams but i'll talk about the grading scale then um so your coursework is going to help you kind of figure out where you are in the grading scale what you need to be working on and how marking is actually carried out marking is um quite strict quite rigid um the pass mark for each coursework, I believe, or each at least each exam is 40%. So once you have completed coursework for each of the modules, coursework counts absolutely towards nothing. Absolutely towards nothing. There is one situation in which it might count if you get a particular grade at the end of your exams for all your seven exams and maybe one falls short of the higher brackets of grade then then your coursework might be considered but I don't know if that's a system that still applies and but generally they don't count for anything 100% weight is on the exam and the exams alone so you want to um you want to know that <laughs> before you jump into this teaching hours um lectures are usually three hours straight um sometimes you get a break you take breaks maybe in the first after the first hour and sit through the next two but generally lectures are lengthy you cover a lot in a very short period of time and you're expected to be learning even more outside um, your lectures so three hours usually and then tutorials are about an hour um, lectures are about three hours you have depending again on your provider I usually would have Mondays off Tuesdays to Friday is class um, so your schedule will change probably um, every week because tutorials were fortnightly at city and then lectures were the same standards so some some days you're coming in I mean I think once a week I got to come in maybe at like 11 12 but all lectures generally started at like 9 a.m which was very very early for me very early. In London, you are on the two by rush hour going to listen to leaseholds and such in the morning. It's quite intense. It's a lot of heavy information to intake. You're finishing your day at like four or five, maybe six if the lecture runs long for any reason or there's an extension. And then you're subsequently jumping into chambers evenings which I will cover um, in another video. So you have, I found that I was having very, very full days, which I had never had before, running from 9 a.m., leaving my house at like 8 in the morning, 7.30, 8 in the morning, and getting back home almost at 10, 11, because I lived a little further um, from school, about an hour from school. So I had very long, lengthy, long days um, studying the GDL. So that's something, again, to just kind of start to wrap your head around and accept that this is this is the life you're about to live. This is the life that you have signed up for. Um, so teaching hours are, that's how they're spread out. 
it's sustainable everything is kind of in the same place um one thing for international students to know especially the ones coming from the u.s and canada um some canadians might be used to this but there's not a, a lot of uk schools don't have just like one campus especially in london it's a campus but the buildings are split up all over the place so you could have lectures in one building and you're going to need to walk 15 minutes or 20 minutes to another but it's literally whole different streets not on the same campus so kind of running between lectures is also something that you have to kind of be ready to do honestly if you're in london you're walking a lot i did not walk this much before i moved to london mm -mm. it was not part it was not part of my plan but this legal career that i decided to sign up for in this jurisdiction has made me a walker i can think i can tell you that much <laughs> The final thing I think I should bring to your attention is that you have, usually you would have the options to write or type the exams in June. Um, so you choose what's more comfortable for you. There's not an unfair advantage in any actual sense, but you just really need to choose what works for you. If you feel like you're faster typing, you can write a lot more, then you pick that. And if you feel like your handwriting is a lot easier, more speedy for you, and that's fine. I tried both, um, but I settled with writing. I think writing was just much easier for me. I felt like I could get more information out um, quickly. Um, now let's come to how the pandemic has probably shifted all of these things that we've talked about, um, that I've talked about, we, <laughs> that I've talked about so far. So in terms of typing and writing the exams, for example, right now, a lot of students are at home taking the exams and typing. Now, they did not have the same option as me and my cohorts to choose between writing or typing. So if you are not someone that is fast at typing and you feel like that would be a disadvantage for you, because it can be for some people, just as writing would be disadvantaging some people um, in that, in terms of speed, um, you want to start getting used to typing now. We don't know what, again, classes are going to look like. A lot of stuff will probably still be stuck online. We will still be doing a lot of things online. The BCAT, and I'm just taking us back a bit, the BCAT, I, I believe, is still being delivered in test centers and people are required to wear a mask and just follow um, certain guidelines. But that is also likely to shift, in my opinion. Now, with the exams, you just want to start making sure that your typing game is up because more likely than not, GDL exams, BPTC exams will be done from home online and you will be needing to type at top speed. The exams last about three hours. You need to answer between, I think, three or four questions out of all the topics you've done over the year and you want to give substantive answers and like, yeah, you want to give substantive answers. Um, so if for if you're like me and typing is just not your thing under time pressure, please start practicing now. Um, lectures are being delivered differently. So um, again, it's all Zoom, it's all online, it's all Microsoft Teams Be learning. Lesson. However, when you apply, when you reach out to these universities, they will let you know what the situation is going to be because if it's going to be online you may completely be able to just jump the visa procedure entirely because you could do that from your home in whatever country that you're in you can actually just get the gdl the only thing is you want to consider um whether you just want to do the gdl online so that those fees apply but again that was that is a decision that would be made by the university anyway to let you know so Chances are the next couple of courses will be online, not on campus. Whether you'll be having three hour um, lectures online, we will see. But that's how long my lectures were. And that's all of that information that I learned sitting in the room is all the information that you still need to learn. So I'm assuming you should be preparing for very, very, very long Zoom calls. Um, or Zoom lectures, I should say. Tutorials will be the same. Um, and yeah, that's that's the, the ways in which I think the pandemic has shifted or has affected the GDL in terms of final exams. Sure. So I think the school should definitely, the providers, the GDL providers should definitely look to a uniform system, but that is something that's yet to be seen. You and I will witness it. Let's wait and see. Um, but yeah, so a lot of these things are shifting, they're changing. 
one thing I will say and I'll say on all of my videos, please do go over the information I provide, over the links, everything I've said in this video. Make sure that you double, triple, quadruple check and make sure that you apply it to your very specific situation. Um, do not take just do not simply take my word for it. I'm only providing some guidance. Um, my word is not the law just yet. <laughs> um, but make sure that you are paying attention to detail because you do not want to miss anything in case I have. If there's anything else you would like me to cover, please leave me, leave me some words, comments, questions in the comment section so that I can address these in my subsequent videos if, it, if I haven't already noted them down to address. Um, and yeah, I hope this was helpful. Again, quite a chatty video, quite a lot of detail, but I want you to go through this process as smoothly as you possibly can. And so I will catch you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Um, look up the links that are down below and get to it.